uh, there to get started this evening. I'll be reading again from the English Standard Version. Uh, first one says, When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong, show yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. To me, it's interesting to consider the final words that people have to say right before they pass from this life. My grandmother uh, just passed this, this, this year, 2020. She wanted to make sure that uh, I took care of her kids, my dad, and took care of my children and loved my wife. And uh, things that people have to say uh, before they pass. But what's the one thing that David had to say about summing up his life here on earth? When he speaks to impart this final wisdom to Solomon. If you look back at what we just read. Does he speak about the importance of hard work? Does he speak about making a lot of money? Or going to school and, and getting smarter? You know, learn from the scholars? Does, does he say that the ultimate goal in life, son, is just have fun? Because life's too short. Does he speak about go and, and conquer a lot of other kingdoms, kind of like I did you know, in, in my life. Go and conquer and get more power. Does he say that? Well, we, we, know, it, we know he doesn't because what we just read. But isn't it interesting that toward the end of Solomon's life, right, he's, going, he's growing old. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, Solomon says, well, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. And isn't that interesting how David said, And keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies. Very same thing. And both of them came to the same conclusion at the end of their lives. Today, uh, tonight, I, I thank God that I can gain such rich insight from these two brothers from so long ago who served God before me. And as a matter of fact, every time there is someone in the pulpit that speaks from the word of God, we're learning about what God has to say and how we can truly become mature Christians. And I'm thankful that I can have a chance to be with you tonight and, and study these things because life is all about discipleship and following God. Walking with him, serving him within the boundaries of his commandments, his testimonies, his rules, and everything that he's told us. So praise God for giving us guidance and direction uh, in our lives like this. Uh, this evening, I'd, I'd like to talk with you. I want, I, what if that was told to us? What if David was saying that, you know, I'm going the way of all the earth. I'm about to die. Do this. You know, what he's telling Solomon, show yourself a man. I want to look at some examples or some ways that we can do that this evening. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully there'll be something that I, I can say this evening that will be of, of some benefit uh, to you before, before we leave. The first thing that I could say that would be a benefit to us as proving ourselves mature is to keep the mission. We talk about what that mission is. We talk about the defense of that mission, and just a couple of examples to illustrate that. I want to uh, start with an event in the life of Brother Paul, right? Uh, confronting the opposition, keeping the mission, and what Paul does so often in his life and his preaching career that we talked about this morning. Acts chapter 13. Acts the 13th chapter. Uh, we must be willing to uh, stand for the cause of Christ I understand that Paul was guided through the Holy Spirit, but he was a willing subject, wasn't he? Uh, he God shows him very well for, for, for his purpose. Acts chapter 13, we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 12 in just a minute, but if you remember, Paul and Barnabas had left Antioch at this time, and they were beginning the first missionary journey as guided by the Holy Spirit. And uh, they had gone down to Seleucia, 
right? And they sailed down to the island of Seleucia, and from there they sailed 60 miles west, or gone down to Seleucia and sailed 60 miles west to Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. At their first stop in Salamis, right, Paul and Barnabas, they preached the word in the synagogues, and that was as Paul's custom is what he liked to do, the Jewish synagogues. John Mark served as their helper. Okay, so after leaving Salamis, the Bible says that they went through the whole island, certainly preaching in various places along the way, until they came to the city of Paphos, right, where they encountered a Jewish sorcerer who was a false prophet, and his name was Bar-Jesus, or Elamus, your translation may say. Some of these uh, so-called sorcerers, they sought knowledge, right? And they wanted to become very wise men. Some of them sought power to control through manipulation uh, of, of the rulers and the wealthy whom they sought to influence through their knowledge. And this particular sorcerer had attached himself to Sergius Paulus. Now, Sergius uh, was a, uh, he was the proconsul of the island, it says. And he was a man of intelligence. He was a man that, obviously it says that he, he recognized the scriptures because he called for Paul and Barnabas. He recognized something there. or He recognized, he saw something interesting in that. And he wanted to, to get Paul and Barnabas uh, before him because he wanted to hear the word of God. So if you're with me in Acts chapter 13, I'm going to begin in verse 4. We'll just read through, through 12. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they, had, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island, as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Okay, that's where we've gotten so far. But Elamus, the magician for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You, son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him. And he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred. For he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So we read about Paul's actions here. As he's guided by the Holy Spirit. We see how he confronts Elamus. We see how he refers to why, you know, his villainy and his being against the mission, basically the mission of preaching the gospel to the lost is, is what we're getting at. And he says, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? It's right to the point, as often Paul does. And how many times, as I reference there, do we read about that in Acts, where Paul confronts any opposition to the preaching of the word of God? He does it in Antioch of Pisidia in Acts 13, right? He did, he did it there when he tur turns to the Gentiles. He did it in Iconium in Acts 14, the first few verses there, when he and Barnabas stayed a long time in order to work more closely with the Gentiles whose minds were poisoned, right, to the gospel. He did it in Lystra in, the in Acts 14 as well, in the same chapter, verses 11 through 18, when the people there wanted to make him and Barnabas gods. He said, no, wait a second. He said, now that, that the, he, they, tear their, they tore their clothes. They were very upset at this attitude from the people. This is not the mission. We are not gods. We're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is God. And he tells them that they've got it all wrong. And, and we alluded to it this morning. But what about Peter when Paul saw him not being straightforward about the truth of the gospel? withdrawing from the Gentiles and separating himself. It says that he withstood Peter to his face. Paul does all of this out in the open. Every, they're, they're, the whole church is there to see that. Does the same thing there in Lystra. Does the same thing in Antioch. And same thing when they're trying to make him gods. He wants to make sure that people understand the church could collapse in any of these situations. 
if or the mission that the message of the gospel could collapse and people could be very confused but Paul keeps the mission in mind every time he was a willing subject to do such things he was I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ Galatians 2 20 or excuse me that's uh, I've been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and such, such so forth and, and so on but he was never ashamed of the gospel of Christ I think that's Romans but we can, can, can we be like Paul? Can we withstand opposition to its face? Would that show that how mature we are as Christians if we were able to do such things? You remember when Jesus told Peter in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 23, get behind me, Satan. He actually looks at Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. It wasn't directed at Peter. It was directed towards his actions, Satan that was in control there. For you are not mindful of the things of God but things of men. Just keep the mission in mind, Peter. If Christ weren't, weren't resurrected, then that entire mission would have been a failure, right? In, in, in so many words. And we understand, we talked about the, the humanity of Peter this morning, that uh, he was focusing on the suffering of, of Jesus there, on that. On he, you know, I, I'm going to be with you, Lord. You're not going to leave us. You know, we're going to be together. And the eventual death that would take place but as we understand, God's purpose and his will is, is going to be accomplished at all times and not ours, right? And in Paul's case, uh, his will was to make disciples of all the nations. He followed the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Go forth and make, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But isn't that what Paul was doing when we referred to Iconium? When he stayed with the disciples some time that were poisoned, he was staying with them to enrich them, to help them understand that this is important. Don't be discouraged by, by what you have heard. And he worked with them and stayed with them to help strengthen the disciples. What is required to prove ourselves mature? We must be people of God and have his mission in mind. We can't be easily discouraged. Uh, as we talked about in James uh, this morning, uh, if you read a little bit further, don't be tossed about with e every wind of doctrine that we hear. But we must be on the alert. I, I like what Paul says. Uh, I think the brother, uh, brother uh, Philip wrote, read it uh, before we got, uh, I got started this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 through 14. And I'll refer back to that. Be watchful, he says in verse 13. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. The emphasis here is, is like I said, not on gender. Uh, he specifically addresses the entire congregation in chapter 1, verses, uh, ver the second verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But according to this, these two verses in 13 and 14, a true mature Christian will be vigilant against danger. He's talking about being watchful, standing firm. A true mature Christian will be faithful to the truth uh, tr uh, in that way, standing firm in the faith. A true Christian would be uh, brave in the face of opposition, being strong, Paul refer refer makes reference to. Uh, and then a, a, a true Christian would be persistent through trials. And above all, loving. It says, let all that you do be done in love in verse 14. So, it's interesting to me, though, uh, that we need, I need a reminder of lessons like this. And to hear Brother Paul live it in his life and preach it to us. Give a letter to the Corinthians. Because he made a similar contrast in the same book to the Corinthians in, verse, in chapter 13 and verse 11, if you're with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. He says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Paul makes a comparison to from adult to a child which we're talking about, how do we know, how, how can we prove ourselves mature? 
And I can tell, as I mentioned this morning, as I get older, I have become more and more of a part of, a com of conversations with older gentlemen, people that are my father's age. Uh, I guess that may just be because of life experiences, uh, but I'm able to, I feel like, have a deeper conversation with my fellow brethren, even in services, uh, about spiritual things. And I find that I'm not running around throwing rocks like I was when I was seven or eight years old. So let me ask you this, quick exercise. Are you able to, before or after services, on the phone, after, on a weekday, call up a brother or sister in Christ and have a deep conversation about spiritual things? Or is it just about the national championship tomorrow between Alabama and Ohio State? Are we able to talk about what Paul did near the end of his life? Are we able to talk with our Christian friends about the period of retirement of Jesus and what he taught during that period and what it means to us as Christians when Jesus gave his life on the cross and how we can be strengthened at work when things aren't going the way that we see that they're supposed to go but that God sees ways that we can keep ourselves at home and with our families rather than traveling all over the world uh, and other jobs. There's things that we can truly understand through our brothers and sisters in the scriptures and, and help each other with, but it, only if we can have these deep conversations uh, that matter in this life. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, we alluded to that this morning. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and verse 13 he describes this ultimate end of discipleship. He says in verses 13 and 14, excuse me, and 15, he says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, that's what I was uh, missing that. It was uh, in 1 Corinthians here. Or Ephesians, excuse me, Ephesians. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Paul's saying we need to know what's right. We need to stand firm in the right. And we need to have a standard, and that, that is Christ. So with that in mind, my second point, Christ's standard was the will of God. If we want to prove ourselves mature, we need to look no further than Jesus Christ. be honest with you. It's already uh, been said, uh, but Jesus Christ, we talked about a little bit this morning, Jesus is uh, all-knowing, he's all-powerful, but yet he was, he was the son of God on the earth. He was the Messiah. He was the epitome of manhood when he reached my age. I'm 34 and I think he's 33. He, he, he was already there. And I have miles and miles to go about understanding and self-control and love and how to be more like Christ. And he's the perfect example of what true maturity is. So if we were to pattern ourselves after the life of Christ and see the examples that he set, I think it's the, the best thing that we can see is that he was obedient to the will of God. Talking about making his mission our mission, making his will our will. He made the will of God his will. And all the examples that we find in Scripture in the life of Christ really fall under that umbrella. Making his will, uh, making God's will his you think about when Jesus was just a, a boy. Uh, think about when he was uh, Joseph and Mary and, and, and he visited Jerusalem observing the Passover. And that's in Luke chapter 2 verses 41 through 50 or about. But they left, Mary and Joseph, to go home and Jesus wasn't with them in the party. You remember this. And uh, Jesus, we know, he was in the temple and he was talking with the teachers, asking them questions, listening to them, gaining you know, knowledge, but maybe teaching. The scriptures say in verse 47 that all who heard him were astonished at his understanding. They were astonished at his answers. 
And it says when his parents found them, remember they were, they were kind of frustrated and, and figured, trying to figure out what they were worried. But you remember Jesus' response to them in verse 49. He said, why did you seek me? He said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And I'm sure you could probably see Joseph looking at him being like, yeah, you're right. Because <laughs> I know where you came from. Uh, but that's pretty interesting. The Bible doesn't say any of that with speculation. But we're talking about Jesus' retirement, that period of retirement just a moment ago. Uh, when Jesus is in Capernaum, he specifically tells what his father's business is, doesn't he? In John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40. John 6, 38 through 40, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me. And he, he defines that or says, That all he has given me, I should, be, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. He's talking about the resurrection. And this is the will of him who sent me. He continues on. What is the will? That everyone who sees the Son, he's talking about himself, and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up in the last day. Those that are true, that, that, that are true to me, that believe in me, that recognize that I am the Savior, that I am the Son of God, that are mature, I will raise them up in the last day. At Summerton, we sing a hymn. It's called The King's Business. It's number 554. Number 554. And uh, I wanted to look at that real quick. It says, uh, It says, I am a stranger here within a foreign land. My home is far away upon a golden strand. A messenger to be of realms beyond the sea. I'm here on business for my king. Second verse. This is the king's command that all men everywhere repent and turn away from sin's seductive snare. That all who will obey with him shall live for a. And that's my business for my king. The third verse. My home is brighter far than Sharon's rosy plain. Eternal life and joy throughout its vast domain. My sovereign bids me tell how mortals there may dwell. And that's my business for my king. This is the message that I bring. A message an angel's fame would sing. Oh, be ye reconciled, this saith my Lord and King. Oh, be ye reconciled to God. So who are we? When I, when I read that, well, the business of, must be about the business of my king, my father's business. What does Jesus say when he answers his parents? We're children of God through faith. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. As many of you as put on Christ. Uh, we are disciples. That, makes, that means that we are followers. We talked about this morning. So we think about what we're here for. You hear people say, I, I'm trying to figure out my purpose in life. I'm trying to figure out what I'm here for. Well, our mission, we understand, is just the same mission as the one that uh, died for us. Our mission is the same mission, is the one that we follow. And our goal is to bring as many people that we can as, as possible. To tell the world about the home that is up there for us. So I think about a couple of examples that Jesus gave for us. Uh, and I've, I've listed on, on the screen here. We need to be able to talk to our Father even as He did because we need a lot of help through this life. Mark, uh, Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. We think about Jesus and how much He talked to His Father. Uh, even through the mission that He was trying to work through. He talked to His Father about it. He says, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. He knew the importance of talking with his father, and, and he made it so. There was another occasion I've listed there in, uh, on the slide, Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, where this is, this is just before Jesus appoints 
his 12 apostles, and I, sometimes I've heard it being called his cabinet. We think about our new presidency that's starting this month. He's going to pick his cabinet, those that are closest to him, those that uh, are ambassadors for him. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. He wasn't afraid to reach out to God. That's, that was his father. It is his father, and it's our father. The same father that he prayed to. We think about that on momentous occasion. Jesus was about to choose those whom he was entrusting with the planting, the organizing, and the training of the church, which was to be purchased by his own blood very soon later. And Jesus caused or used such this important crisis, his death, not as an occasion for anxiety or, or worry, uh, as we see his interactions with those apostles that he appointed. But every time he prays, it, he, he is fitting times in to seek his father. I want to talk with you about these things. If we're going to prove ourselves a man, we've got to be willing to talk to our father. We can't do it on our own. And we can, uh, this same relationship, like I mentioned, we can employ that in our lives because we have that same access to him through, through Jesus Christ. And I, I've referenced, I don't know if I've got it up here, but Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22, if you'd like to, to note that and read it uh, later. So Jesus uh, Christ was the ultimate example of humility and sacrifice for others. Uh, how to face temptation in, in, in Luke chapter 4, verses uh, 1 and following. We read about him being full of the Holy Spirit when he was led away to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And that that same way he responded to the temptations of Satan, he said, as it is written, he refers to scripture when he, when he does that uh, to overcome the temptation. Uh, do you remember we referenced uh, Galatians 2 verse 20 just a minute ago? Do you remember how the Apostle Paul talked about his life in Christ? He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9, he makes it his aim to be pleasing to God every day. Uh, and therefore, I would, if I'm going to truly be a, a mature Christian, I want to make it my aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing in this life or the next. That's what he refers to. But I think isn't it amazing that I can be pleasing to God? Uh, we, we might have never been a pleasing to our parents. Uh, we might have a father that was very demanding or a mother that was very uh, hands-off. Just didn't, it was hard to please them. I know several people like that, but we can be pleasing to God. We sure can. Uh, because Jesus lived in complete dependence and obedience of the will of God and he died for it. Uh, the, la the last point that I'd like to make is really something that we, we can talk about the examples of the apostles. We can talk about the example of Christ and we can read about that. One of the greatest blessings that we have as Christians is to have the, the blessing of Christ. Uh, and through his blood, we have all the blessings that we have in this life and the promises that were given to us through his son that resurrection that we will experience. But something at the very end here, if you bear with me the last few minutes that I have, I want to talk about the relationship that we have with others, and specifically our spouse. Um, I, sometimes I go ad hoc and it's dangerous, but I tell my wife sometimes, uh, I didn't know love even after I met you, I didn't truly know what love is. And you have taught me love. And God gives us children. He gives us our spouses. He gives us families so that we can understand the love, the sacrificial love that he had for us by giving us Jesus. Um, it's been said that one can tell a lot, of, by a, man, a lot about a man by looking at his wife. You may have heard the saying, behind every great man is a great woman. Okay, it's a good saying, but how about this one? Behind every great man stands no woman, 
There is no greater man than the man that can acknowledge the woman standing right next to him. Proverbs chapter 31, uh, verses 23 through 25, says that her husband, it's Proverbs 31, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Well, that's great. The husband is, is known. But that's because of her. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. So the, the husband of this Proverbs 31 woman is respected at the city gates. But, and we can see that he's a man of great influence. And I, I wonder why is that? All these great things and what she does. Why is that? I believe one of the reasons why that the husband of the Proverbs 31 woman is respected is because of her diligence. We read here that she's willing to use her talents to add to her family's finances here. But she does not sacrifice the family to pursue those. Because of what she does inside the home, she was a reflection of her husband outside the home. And that reflection brought him respect. I love seeing how together, uh, even reading Proverbs 31, you think about the husband and the wife relationship. I love seeing that how together they have a mighty impact for the Lord, both inside and outside the home. And I want us to think about that relationship for just a minute and think about what it means to be proving ourselves a man, what David wanted Solomon to know. And what my grandmother told me, love your wife. Be good to your kids. Uh, what did it mean to her at the end of this life? The place where th this Proverbs 31 woman drew her strength and her moral character uh, in verse 25 is because she knows that her future is in God's hands all the time. And she brings her confidence to rejoice in time to come, it says, right? Her confidence isn't, isn't in her own abilities here from what I read and I understand about this, this scripture. Her worthiness as a, as a mother or a wife is not in herself. Her, her excellence in running her home business, making sashes for the merchants. No, her, her confidence is, is from her relationship with God. Her confidence comes because she knows who she is. She's a child of God, and she knows that no matter what happens on this earth, she belongs to him. And because of that focus, brothers and sisters, that has brought respect to her husband, and both of them have become more mature because of it in thought and in action and in deed. And she's glorifying God in everybody that sees her and him. Can you tell a lot about a man by looking at his wife? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I, I put a note there on the slide. What, what can we start doing that will help our spouse be the husband or the wife of influence that God is calling them to be? Looking inward at ourselves. There's a passage in Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs the 5th chapter if you're still in in uh, Proverbs this evening. I'd like to, to read that. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. It's a very fascinating scripture to me. Uh, it was difficult for me to, to interpret and understand. I had to look around research. But I believe uh, this has changed the way that I look at my wife. Um, and I've, I'm hoping that it would uh, give me a better attitude. Um, uh, both to, to, to God and, and, and my wife in general. But it says in chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Her, her breasts satisfy you. And always be enraptured with her love. And I want to focus on that last uh, line after the semicolon here in my in my translation always be enraptured with her love that word used in verse 19 to describe a husband's attitude toward his wife enraptured your, your passage might say uh, something different but enraptured is what the English standard version says 
That usually means in the original Hebrew from what I found is to be uh, intoxicated. Be intoxicated with her love. Uh, to be deceived almost. Go astray. The thought is that any normal rational behavior has been overridden. Uh, passion, enticement, uh, foolishness, something that has overwhelmed a person so that cautious, controlled thinking has gone out the window. That's the kind of thinking that is being described here. This passage is saying within the sanctity of marriage, uh, right? Deliberately intensify your passions until you can hardly think straight, brothers. Regularly so influence your feelings for your spouse that you lose control of yourself, almost, basically, in your thoughts and love toward her. Don't merely let nature take its course, but get so focused on her, so enamored by her that she blows the circuits of your brain, you might say. Can you love your wife that much? Now, if this is beginning to sound a little bit extreme or even impossible, then uh, maybe we need to take a few seconds to examine the source of information here. Where are we reading from? Proverbs. We're looking into the words of the man that David was talking to before he died. And we're looking into the words of a man that was the wisest one to ever live. A man, uh, the scripture says, had a unique wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 12 says, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. Intellectually, we're reading the words of a man who stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Far more significantly, however, we're reading from the word of God, right? So suppose... Uh, let me give you an example here. Suppose you have a, a new car. This is kind of a strange example, uh, but maybe you'll uh, get what I'm trying to say. After a few months, you finally get around to looking at the manufacturer's manual in the car. I usually don't look at those, but maybe you get a look at it. You are astounded to read that the speed of the book says that the car will go. You've never per, uh, pushed the car to its limits, but the figure seems incredible to you. The truth is that your car is capable of what the book says, or you have every right to keep hounding the manufacturer until he makes your car able to reach those speeds. And you can come with this degree of confidence and greater to the scripture that we're seeking to understand right here in Proverbs chapter 5. Do you remember Job, uh, Job chapter 31, uh, verse 1? He said that he would never look uh, with desire at any woman other than his wife. And obviously to keep that vow, this attitude had to dominate his behavior, not only when his wife was near, but when she was not as well, right? Whatever, whoever woman was in sight. Because he understands true godliness in this regard. Uh, far more than failing to break the commandments uh, that he knows in the book of the law of Moses. True godliness is the pursuit of love. I love my wife so I'm going to practice self-control. And goodness. And it's not merely to avoid promiscuity or uh, adultery. It's to do everything in his power to delight in his wife. Right? So let me give you an example uh, or something to think about here. Be ho-hum about the pose of a model on a magazine. Find the latest assortment of beauties as interesting as dishwater, but banish the slightest trace of a been there, done that attitude toward the wife whom you've seen a thousand times. Uh, 
find unclad supermodels as bland as raw potatoes, but thrill at the intimacy of your wife letting, her, letting you see her hair in curlers. How about that, brothers? Let Miss Universe have a crocodile smile, pluck chicken skin, and ostrich legs, but tingle at the thought of holding the hand that wears your ring. Let your heart skip to the moon at the sight of the stretch marks caused by your baby. That is God's challenge for us. And to understand the love that he gave when he sent his son to this earth to die for us so that we didn't have to. So that we could understand true love. And the love that I have for my wife is unfathomable. I can't even describe it. And it grows even more because I have a child of my own too now. Prove yourself a man. I hope tonight I've said a, a, a word or two that would be uh, helpful to you. I'd certainly, uh, more things that we could have talked about and a totally different approach that could be made, uh, but uh, I gave it a shot. <laughs> I, I hope that I hit on the right things uh, because the ultimate example of uh, manhood and maturity as a Christian truly is Christ, the perfect example. And making uh, what he told us to do or what he told us he did was making God's will his. So why don't we do the same thing, conform? And the best way that I know to understand why he did all of this and came to this earth is because God gave me somebody that shows me a little bit of that true love and that I, how I can be better uh, for him. And never depart from the faith. Uh, never depart from her, never depart from the faith. That's truly an amazing thing that God has, has drawn up, the, master, the greatest architect that ever lived. Proving ourselves as a man, said David. Uh, Solomon, the end of all things is, is vanity, uh, but except uh, to accept that Jesus, our God, uh, has set some things for us in place, and we too can be with God one day and enjoy those blessings. Um, as I said this morning, um, I never want to close without extending an invitation. If there's anyone here that has not um, uh, accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and understand that uh, what he did, after we've read uh, through the things that we've read tonight uh, and studied him this morning, if you were here this morning, to think about uh, the self-control that he had to exhibit to go all the way to the end for us when I possibly would have given up and given in uh, to the things that were uh, being demanded of me. He went through it all so that you and I could be made right and we could be forgiven uh, of our sins. If you've not made that commitment in your life, realize that you are separated from God because of sin uh, and that no man uh, is perfect except Jesus Christ. All have sinned and fallen short in Romans uh, of the glory of God. And we too must be made right through the blood of Christ. If you are a Christian this evening and sin has separated you from that relationship, I plead with you, brethren, before you walk out of this door that you, you think about that relationship that you have with God and you treasure that and you want to make that right again. We can do something. Uh, you can do something about that. You can pray to God that he will forgive you. You can repent, do a 180, and vow to, to, to turn back to that life of uh, service to God. If we can pray with you or for you, uh, please come forward as we sing for your, your encouragement. Help me.
Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful this day for all the many blessings of it. We are thankful, dear Father, for your word being taught. Pray that you'll help us that our wisdom and our faith will be increased. We are thankful that now that we can remember the death of your son. We pray that this one would take of it in a well pleasing manner to you. Thankful for this bread. Pray that you'll bless it. It represents Christ's body. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's bow again. Dear Father in heaven, we're also thankful for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that Jesus shed for us. Help us to partake in a manner well pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Anything that may have been there, anything 